Good morning, church, and welcome. We hope that you have had a wonderful Thanksgiving season. We hope you've spent time with family. We want to continue this season of Thanksgiving today and our worship. Uh, the theme for this morning is uh, Thanksgiving in song and in scripture. And would you please stand and join us as uh, we have this call to worship. The mighty God summons the earth from the rising of the sun to the place where it sets. Our God comes and will not be silent. God calls and we respond to his love. The heavens declare God's righteousness. We tell out God's glories. Offer up to God your thanksgiving. And our God will hear us, save us, and stay with us forever. Every praise is to our God, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Every praise is to our God, every word of worship with one accord. Every praise, every praise is to our God. Sing hallelujah to our God. Glory hallelujah is to our God. Every praise, every praise is to our God. God my Savior, God my healer, God my deliverer, yes he is, yes he is, my God, God my Savior, God my healer, Thessalonians. How can we thank God enough for you in return for all the joy that we feel before our God because of you? Night and day we pray most earnestly that we may see you face to face and restore whatever is lacking in your faith. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, just as we abound in love for you. And may he so strengthen your hearts in holiness that you may be blameless before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. Good morning. My name is Jason Henley, and I'm the Connections Delegate here at the Springs. Um, and I just wanted to give a little leader moment, letting you know kind of the current state of Connections real quick. We currently have nine groups um, that are meeting regularly and have an open seat for you. We would love to connect you with one of those open 
groups, whether you're uh, either not in a group or if your group is currently not meeting and you're wanting to reach out for that connection. I believe that uh, we're all called to be engaged in the word and in the body one way or another. And in Acts 2, 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. So I think that sounds pretty engaged to me. Maybe engagement for you looks like leading a new connections group. Is the Spirit prompting you with ideas of what that group might look like? Maybe your new group will cause a little bit of hope in somebody that you have no idea. Let's see if you've heard this. This is for the busted heart. This is for the question marks. This is for the outcast soul, lost control, no one knows. Sing it for the can't go back. Sing it for the broken past. Sing it for the just found out. Life is now upside down. If you're looking for hope tonight, raise your hand. If you're feeling alone and don't understand. If you're fighting in the fight of your life, then stand. We're going to make it through this hand in hand. That one is a little excerpt of a song called Together by For King and Country. Maybe this one's a little bit more popular. You are not hidden. There's never been a moment you were forgotten. You are not hopeless. That one is from Rescue by Lauren Daigle. Do you know what these two excerpts have in common? They give hope. This is something I feel very most prevalent in most healthy connections groups is hope. In times of celebration or in times of sorrow, you have loving people to your left and to your right to walk you through these times. You are not hidden. You are not alone. Connections groups are a place to find hope. Will you guys pray with us? Spirit, we invite you here. We thank you so much for the season of thanksgiving and the heart of, uh, of your son. Father, we, we give you great thanks for this season of Advent and the coming of your son that we, we have hope in. Father, may we, may we be instruments of that hope, whether it be just in our daily lives with friends or at work or or with the people who we do life with in our connection group, God, just fill us so that we can overflow and give those who need it more than we do. Just help us to give them hope. Father, we pray these in your name. Amen. Come, let us sing for the joy of the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and ex extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great king above all gods. Would you stand as we sing again? Mm -hmm. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, he made it, and his hands form the dry land. 
and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. For the Lord is a great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. And his hands formed the dry land. Would you read this scripture, scripture with us, please? Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Come into his presence with joy and thanksgiving. Come into his presence with praise. Come into his presence with joy and thanksgiving. Come into his presence with praise. Come into his presence with joy and thanksgiving. Come into his presence with praise. Come into his presence with joy and thanksgiving. Come into his presence with praise. This is a place of forgiveness and love, and we are a people who benefit from a gracious and loving, benevolent God who seeks those who worship his name. Come into his presence with joy and thanksgiving. Come into his presence with praise. Come into his presence with joy and thanksgiving. Come into his presence with praise. This is a place of forgiveness and love, and we are a people who benefit from a gracious and loving, benevolent God who seeks those who worship his name, worship his name. Come into his presence with joy and thanksgiving. Come into his presence with praise. Come into his presence with joy and thanksgiving. Come into his presence with praise. Read with us again, please. I will give thanks to the Lord because of his righteousness. I will sing the praises of the name of the Lord Most High. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wondrous deeds. For all that you've done, I will thank you. For all that you're going to do. For all that you promised and all that you are is all that has carried me through. Jesus, I thank you, and I thank you, thank you, Lord, and I thank you, thank you, Lord, thank you for loving and setting me free. Thank you for giving your life just for me, how I thank you, Jesus, I thank you, gratefully thank you, thank you, for all that you've done I will thank you, for all that you're going to do for all that you promised and all that you are is all that has carried me through Jesus I thank you and I thank you thank you
Thank you for loving and setting me free. Thank you for giving your life just for me. Now I thank you. Gratefully thank you. Gratefully thank you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. The trumpeters and musicians joined in unison to give praise and thanks to the Lord. Accompanied by trumpets, cymbals, and other instruments, the singers raised their voices in praise to the Lord and sang, He is good. His love endures forever. I'm going to do this song just a little bit different. In the early church, they engaged in something called antiphonal singing, and that is where one group would sing to another group, and they'd sing back and forth to each other. And that's kind of how we're going to do this song. And so we're going to do it a phrase at a time. Let me get the right pitch here, and we'll I'm going to start on this side, and it's going to be, For the beauty of the earth. And then this side is going to sing, For the beauty of the sky. And we're going to go back and forth like that, except we're all going to sing together on the chorus. And I'll point when it's your time to sing. Okay? Mm -hmm. For the beauty of the earth. For the beauty of the sky. For the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Now everybody. Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise for the beauty of each hour of the day and of For the joy of human love, brother, sister, parent, child, friends on earth and friends above, for all gentle thoughts and mild, Lord of all, to Thee we raise this our sacrifice. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Oh, let me not be ashamed, let not my enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that way all be me ashamed. Yea, let none that way all be me ashamed. O my Lord, I trust in Thee. Oh, let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Remember not the sins of my youth. Remember not the sins of my youth. Oh my God, I trust in Thee. Oh, let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. 
be seated, please. Well, good morning, Springs Church. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to each and every one of you here this morning. We're glad that you're with us today. Welcome to those of you here in the room and to those of you tuning in online and, of course, visitors. Thank you so much for being with us. We're grateful for your presence today. And I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving. I hope your Thursday was great. I hope you had some time with family and friends, and I hope your plates and hearts are full, and I hope it was just a wonderful holiday for you all, but it's good to be back in this room with you. And speaking of holidays or holy days, it's a special Sunday to be here at the Springs because like other churches around the world, we are starting the season of Advent this morning. And I've talked a little before, we've talked about how Advent and the first Sunday of Advent is a little bit like New Year's Day. Right? This is kind of the moment that the church year sort of turns over and starts again, and we walk from Advent through Christmas, and there's Lent and Easter and all the rest, but this is a special day to be here because we're focusing on the arrival of God in Christ and specifically of the love of God that we see in that arrival. Advent is a time that stands between these two arrivals, which is what the word Advent means. The arrival of God in the incarnation of Jesus and the second coming of Christ to judge the living and the dead. So I'm grateful you're here with us this morning to kick off the season of Advent. We'll be doing this for the next three weeks after this Sunday leading up to Christmas as we prepare our hearts for the coming of God's love. And we're doing that this morning. The text we're going to be spending time with is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 10. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O oh my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O oh Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. All the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. Let's pray. God, we come before you this morning with gratitude in our hearts. God, we give thanks once again for this word before us. And we thank you for your love. We thank you for the love that showed up in Jesus Christ. And we ask for ears to hear this morning. We ask for the illumination of your Holy Spirit. And God, I ask for the gift of preaching. Give us the hearts and minds and bodies and wills to obey your word. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. That may be counterintuitive, but I believe it to be true. There are all different sorts of things that could come into our minds when we think about God. But what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most defining feature of who we are and how we live our lives. 
I'm sure many atheists and agnostics would disagree with me here, but I believe it to be true even in that case. Our conception or even our non-conception of God shapes who we are. It shapes how we live. It shapes the next step we take in our lives. We can think of an angry, old, white-bearded man in the sky. That might come into our minds when we think about God. Or maybe we think of this divine spark that's kind of present in all of creation and really isn't even any different than the world itself, doesn't transcend it. We could think of God in that way. But Christians, for a long time now, have thought and confessed that if you wanted to define God in three words, you could simply say, God is love. God is love. In fact, 1 John chapter 4 puts it that way when it says, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. God is love. And the reason we know that God is love is because God arrived. God showed up. God sent his son, Jesus, to reveal to us his true nature so that what comes into our minds when we think about God is love. Advent is the time we remember and remind each other that God's true nature is love. And he has come to show us that. And so we're going to think through that this morning with Psalm 25, beginning in verses 1 through 3. It says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exult over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. The writer of this psalm is in distress. Holidays can be a stressful time, right? Holidays can be a joyous, wonderful time, a great season. But it can also be a uniquely painful time, as we know. And if you're somebody who's in pain, somebody who's in distress this morning, the psalmist of Psalm 25 can relate to you. He's worried about his enemies. He's worried about his sins, the sins of his youth. He's worried about being put to shame. He says, God, do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Waiting on God is a posture of trust. And that's one of the themes of Psalm 25. This idea of trusting in God, of lifting up our soul to God. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Right? To lift up our soul to God is to give him our life, is to open our hands before him and to wait in a posture of trust. But waiting is risky, right? Waiting is risky if what you're waiting for doesn't show up. He says, don't let me be put to shame. Don't let those who wait for you be put to shame. Waiting is hard to do. In one of my favorite Tom Petty songs, he says, what does he say? You take it on faith, you take it to the heart. The waiting is the hardest part. The waiting is the hardest part. And Advent is a time to remind ourselves that we are actually waiting on something. We're not just walking through lives like anybody else in the world. Christians believe we're actually waiting on the love of God to show up. Christians believe that we don't just entrust our lives to ourselves. We don't just white knuckle our own security and deliverance. But we're actually waiting on the deliverance of God's love. One of my favorite children's books to read with the boys is Dr. Seuss's Oh, the Places You'll Go. Maybe you've read it 
with your kids or maybe even yourself, it's kind of a popular graduation present because it really captures just so much wit and wisdom on life's journey. And in fact, it was one of the last books, I believe the last book, published during the lifetime of Dr. Seuss. And there's a protagonist in the book, but it's also written in the second person. It's written to you. So I I love reading this book with Jeremiah and Asher. And I was thinking about waiting this past week, of course. And I was thinking about the way that Seuss depicts waiting in this book. Because about halfway through the book, the character gets all tangled up and confused, and they're grinding on miles across weirdish, wild space, as he says. And then they come to the most useless place, the waiting place, where people are just waiting. Waiting for a string of pearls, or a pair of pants, or a wig with curls, or another chance. People are just waiting. And then when you turn the page, there's in big capital letters, exclamation point, no, that's not for you. You'll escape all that waiting and staying. You'll find the bright places where boom bands are playing. And I think Dr. Seuss has really captured something true about us. He's captured something true about our culture that for us, waiting is not only with Tom Petty, the hardest part, but waiting for us is wasteful. It's bad. It's something to be avoided at all costs. We, we don't want to wait. It's the last thing we want to do, and really, we don't even think it's worthwhile. Waiting is not only difficult, it's not only the hardest part, it's bad, right? It's, it's for the drab and dreary masses to just sit there and wait and stay. And that's how we live our lives, right? That, that's a truth about our culture. We, we don't want to wait. Waiting is, is wasteful. We live high speed, fast lane, instant cup pre-checked lives. And a lot of good things have come from that. But I think one of the things maybe we've lost is the idea that we can wait well. That waiting can be worth something. And as Christians, we believe that waiting is worthwhile. As Christians, we remember that we are a people who wait. We are waiting upon the love of God. But waiting is hard to do, and so we need instruction. We are students in need of a teacher. We are mentees in need of a mentor. When we don't know how to wait, we need to learn. And so the psalmist continues in verses four through six. He says, make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Remember, they're in distress, the writer of this psalm. They're in uncertainty. They're worried. They don't know where to turn. They don't know what next step to take. And so they ask God for guidance. Teach me. Show me your paths. I need a a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When we don't know where to go, we need instruction in the truth. And somewhat paradoxically, for the psalmist and for the Christian, knowing when and where to take the next step, knowing how to move ahead, means first looking behind. For the Christian, waiting in the season of Advent, knowing how to proceed means knowing what's behind us, right? He says in verse 6, be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. If we want to know God's love, if we want to know God's truth, if we want to know his paths, we've got to look to his love from of old. 
Paradoxically, we've got to look behind us in order to see where we're going. And our culture tells us that we've always got to be pointed forward, though. Our society is telling us we've got to move ahead. We've got to advance. We've got to make progress. We love progress. Progress is good for progress's sake. What are we progressing towards? We're not sure. It might be a cliff, but we're making progress towards it. And progress is good. I'm grateful for progress. But it does matter what we're progressing towards. And for the Christians soaked in the imagination of Scripture, how we find where we're going is by looking back behind us. Right? Are we moving deeper and deeper into the future of God's coming love, or are we moving into chaos, hatred, and strife? For the Christian, in order to see what's ahead, we look back. In order to see the second coming, we look back to the first coming. In fact, there's a photographer named Sally Mann, and she has a memoir called Hold Still. And in her memoir, she quotes actually from the diary of her father. She quotes a passage from her, her dad's journals in which her dad asked this question. He said, do you know how a boatman faces one direction while rowing in another? Do you know how a boatman faces one direction while rowing in another? Church, God leads us forward by pointing us backward to his love. God leads us forward by pointing us backward to his love. It's by looking back at the first coming of God, the first revealing of his love in Jesus Christ, that we look ahead to the future we walk into. It's by looking back at the history, the record of God's love for Israel, God's love for the world, God's love for us in our lives, that we see the light on our paths in front of us. And we know how to walk into the future of God's love. In fact, as the prophet Jeremiah said in chapter 6, verse 16, he says, Thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look, and ask for the ancient paths, where the good way lies, and walk in it, and find rest for your souls. We wait on God's coming future by looking to the history of his love. And so the psalmist continues in verses 8 and 9. He says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. Waiting is hard. But Christians believe we're waiting on something good. That's why waiting is valuable. Right? Good things come to those who wait, goes the truism. And that's what we believe. We believe we're waiting, in fact, on the ultimate good. God himself, good and upright, is the Lord. What does it mean to say that God is good? What does it mean to say that the God who comes in love at Advent is a good God? That the God that appears in our minds when we think about God is good. Well, what does it mean to say that anything is good? Right? Let's do something dangerous right before lunch and think back to our plates on Thursday. There's some good stuff on those plates. Good things. Turkey, potatoes, green bean casserole, pumpkin pie. Not to be controversial. I love pumpkin pie. I know some of you don't. Pumpkin pie is good. What does it mean to say that this pie is good? Well, we're talking about all kinds of different properties, the crust and the spices and the consistency, the flavors. But when we say that pie is good, we're saying something different than when we say Jim is a good man. Right? When we say pie is good, we mean something similar but also dissimilar than when we say Jim is a good man, right? It's analogous, the way we use good for pie and the way we use good for a man. 
But what about God? What do we mean when we say God is good? Again, we mean something similar to pie or a human, but we also mean something completely different, don't we? Because not only is God good, God is not merely good. God is goodness itself. God is the good, the absolute good. And all other things that are good are only good to the extent that they participate in God. God is not merely good. God is goodness itself. He's the the ground and very possibility of anything being good. That pie, gym, life, anything is only good to the extent that it participates in God's goodness which is the good itself. Good and upright is the Lord. And every good thing comes from God. Remember back to James chapter one. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows. When we think about God, the God that we wait upon, We are thinking about the God who is goodness itself. The God whose goodness is his love, and his love is his goodness. They're the same thing. And so the psalmist says in verse 10, all the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness for those who keep his covenant and his decrees. It's not enough to simply know God's paths. It's not enough to simply sit and wait upon him. It's not enough to simply know he's good and loving. The Christian waits in action. The Christian waits by actually walking on that path. The Christian waits by keeping his covenant decrees. It's not the kind of dreary, drab, humdrum, Dr. Seuss waiting place kind of waiting. Instead, waiting for God and his love means walking in the way of God's love. Waiting for God's love means walking in the way of God's love. It means putting it into practice. It means actually acting upon it. It means an active kind of waiting, not just a sitting, but a waiting by walking in the way of God's love. Isn't that the very heart of 1 John? Remember the scripture we started with? Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God. And knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. We know that God is love because God arrived in Jesus. That's what we're dwelling with in Advent. That's what we remember in this season, is that God has shown up so that in our heads we might know, in our hearts we might see, and in our lives we might walk in the ways of the God who is love. The God who loves us so much that he showed up. And we love that God when we put his words into practice. When Jesus says, when you keep my commandments, we know and love that God when we see that all the paths of the Lord are faithfulness and he's calling us down those paths. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. It's the most important direction on our compass. To know where to walk is to know who God is. But perhaps the only thing more important than what comes into our minds when we think about God is who God actually is. Because our minds will never fully comprehend it. 
Our minds will never fully grasp it, fully get at exactly who God is. What's most important is who God really is, what he's done, and what he has done is he's given us a table. The God of love has given us tables to wait around. He's given us tables to gather at, to learn his love, to wait upon him, to remind each other and teach each other what it means to walk in his ways of steadfast love and faithfulness. That's the God we wait upon this morning, church. As we come around the tables this morning, I want to encourage you to remind each other of God's love. Remind each other of who God is and remind each other that we are a people who wait and that God is coming to rescue us in love. Church, let's come to the tables this morning. Love one another, for love is of God. He who loves is born of God and knows God. She who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Sing with us again, please. <clears throat> Lay your burden down, every care you carry, and come to the table of grace, for there is mercy. Fall on your knees and 
pray for the King of kings and the love he brings is here in this place. We raise our voices, raise our song, offer him our praise for the King of kings and the joy he brings is here, he is here in this place. Lay your burden down, every care you carry, and come to the table of grace, for there is mercy. of God, for He is holy. Lift up your heart, lift up your hands, fall on your knees and pray, for the King of kings and the love He brings is here in this place. We raise our voices, raise our song, offer Him our praise for the King of kings and the joy He brings is here, He is here. We wrap your heart, lift up your hands, fall on your knees and pray for the and the love he brings is here in this place. We raise our voices, raise our song, offer him our praise for the King of kings and the joy he brings is here, he is here in this place. Come, thou fount of every blessing, tune thy heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, hither by thy help I come, and I hope by thy good Safely to arrive at home. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from danger, interposed his precious blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to Seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Let's read the scripture together. I will give you thanks in the great assembly. Among the throngs I will praise you. 
I will praise God's name in song and glorify him with thanksgiving. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. And now let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks, give thanks, give thanks. Amen. Well, I'm grateful for you all this morning, and I'm glad you're here safely with us. Those of you traveling, be safe as you head home. I want to invite you to be here next Sunday for the second Sunday of Advent. I hope you'll join us. And if you're a visitor, please fill out a visitor card or give us a chance to talk with you afterwards. We're so grateful that you're with us this morning. I want to leave you with the words of Paul from Ephesians chapter 3 this morning. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge mm -hmm. that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Go in peace, church. Mm -hmm.